uh, great expectations for this evening. And so um, we thank you again for joining us online and being a part of our evening Bible study. Let me pray, and then I'll turn it over to Brother Marlon. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks uh, for the opportunity to be here this evening. We thank you, Lord God, for your word and being able to study it as a church, to be encouraged in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and challenged in our walk with you. We pray for this um, new uh, subject we're studying, uh, the doctrine of salvation and its eternal consequences. We uh, pray for enlightenment for ourselves. Uh, this is good for all of us, whether we've just been saved or we've been saved for 30 years. Uh, all of us need a, a refresher on what took place at salvation. And we, we thank you for Elder Marlin as he leads us into the knowledge of the, of the truth. I pray that we would comprehend this. I pray for anyone listening, maybe who, who is not saved, that they would see the need for salvation and that they may turn to Christ in saving faith, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Appreciate that, uh, Pastor. And uh, for those who, uh, well, whether you were here or not, you know, uh, I mean, well, not that you know, but last week, um, when we, we, as Pastor said, we started this, uh, this series last week, and, uh, and one of the passages that we looked at really kind of set the, uh, the foundation for what we're, what we're doing throughout is in, in the, uh, the book of John, chapter 3, and that's where... Uh, where Jesus actually, you know, obviously in this conversation with, with Nicodemus, he actually contrasts the natural life produced by two human beings with the new birth that's actually produced by the, uh, the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that we saw is that the life produced by the Spirit is actually a prerequisite for a person to be saved. And that was one of the things we, we looked at last week. We also saw that because the Spirit is the one who produces the new birth, the life is said to be spirit. And that was one of the things we looked at where the type of life you have is determined by who produced the life. And so that's why Jesus said of the uh, lives that, or the life that a, a, a man and a woman produces is, is flesh. But the life that's produced by the Holy Spirit is, is spirit. And so that was one of the things we saw last week. But when, when he says the life is spirit, in other words, it's spiritual in nature. Uh, and, and one of the implications for when a person experienced the new birth is that Really, for, for the first time, that person is able to, um, I guess you could say they're able to perceive spiritual realities that, that, that he had never been able to, uh, that he didn't even know existed. And so th this, this is only because now this person is, is spirit. Uh, and, and, and the thing is, I say that um, he's able to perceive spiritual realities that he didn't know even existed, but it's not just that he didn't know that those uh, spiritual realities existed, the issue is, it wasn't even possible for him to know that they existed. And the reason is because he had no spiritual life prior to the new birth. <laughs> in, in fact, uh, the Apostle Paul made that very point in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 2.14. In fact, Pastor actually uh, referenced that, that passage even earlier, uh, in, if you were here for the, uh, the, morning, the morning's message. But in 2.14, Paul said uh, that a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. They are spiritually appraised. And so it's impossible uh, for a natural man basically to, to properly examine something spiritually. You know, it, it can't happen. But, but thanks to the new birth that those who have been saved are now said to be spirit. And, and because of their new life, they're able to appraise the things of the Spirit of God. In fact, in just a, um, a verse right back, I mean, in, in verse 12 of that same, um, same book in 1 Corinthians, this is what it says about, about people who, who, uh, who, who have the Spirit. It says, now we have received, notice this, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God. 
And so, uh, you know, you see, the, you see the contrast, but, but just like there are some things that, that come along with being flesh or, or human, there are some things that, that actually come along with, with the new life that the saved person now has as a result of the, uh, the work of the Spirit. And so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to actually see, see that the, the, uh, the Spirit, because last, last week when we talked about the new birth, uh, one of the things I said was that, we, that, that shows us God's involvement in, uh, in, in the saving process. And so he, he himself actually satisfies the prerequisite. But what we're going to see tonight is that the Spirit's involvement doesn't end with the prerequisite for salvation. In other words, he doesn't, he doesn't cause you to be born again and then just leave you on your own. Okay, you know, I've given you new life and now, you know, that, that's it. You know, it, it, it doesn't, you know, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't do that. There are other things that, that actually, that he does and, and, and specifically in relation to salvation that we're going to see. And, and, and those are things that, that are really, as I refer to them as the effects of salvation. Because last week we talked about the prerequisite for salvation, obviously the new birth. But there are things that come out of that, you know, that come out of, uh, salvation and so they, they come along with being saved and so what we're going to do tonight is, is we'll look at just a few of them obviously it's not exhaustive uh, it's not even intended to be but but after discussing just a few of the, the uh, spiritual realities and we're going to consider the implications of each one of them and I, I want to do it that way instead of instead of uh, discussing the implications after after each one that is actually uh, mentioned and so that's that's kind of the, uh, the approach that we're, we're going to talk about tonight so as you see on the screen we're dealing with things that accompany salvation, things that accompany salvation. And so the first one I want to look at is the fact that the believer has been sealed. The believer has been sealed. And, um, and so what I want to do first is just, just look at a couple of passages where, first of all, the idea of believers being sealed is actually communicated. And so we'll see this. Uh, but first I want to look at, we'll look at Ephesians chapter, chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and uh, in, in this section, Paul is actually mentioning several realities that, uh, that believers actually have in Christ, and after he's, he's listing these, these realities, listen to what he says in, uh, in verse 13 of Ephesians 1, verse 13. Now, he's, he's listing all these realities, and then he says, in him, obviously talking about Christ, in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed with him with the Holy Spirit of promise. And, and the thing is, it's, it's clear that this sealing that Paul actually wrote about wasn't something that was unique to the Ephesians. You say, well, well why, why do you say that? How, how do you know that? Well, he said the same thing when he wrote to the Corinthians. And in fact, listen to what he says in, um, in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, what is it? I'm sorry, in... 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'll read verses uh, 21 in the first part of uh, 22. He said, um, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us. Who also sealed us. Uh, now, Those who have been sealed, who basically those who have been saved have also been sealed. And so we see, as I said, the, the fact of the sealing, but what does it even mean? You know, we looked at a couple of passages. Okay, yeah, you've established, you know, you, you've shown from the scripture that believers have actually been sealed. What, you know, what, what does that actually mean? Well, this idea of the word, this idea of seal, it, it actually can be used in different ways. Um, and it actually is used in different ways. And, and one way it's used is to communicate the idea that something of, of something being securely wrapped up for protection uh, and that's that's one way and when it's used that way it can actually be figuratively or or literally and so uh you know for example using it figuratively someone might say and, and you, you've heard this but my, my lips are sealed you know my lips are sealed and and so if someone says that that their lips are sealed what that person is actually saying is that you know that there's some information that that they won't be sharing with anyone uh, in, in other words, the information is actually protected. It's, it's safe with them. You know, my, my lips are sealed. And so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's the figurative use of the, uh, this idea of, of seal when it means to securely wrap up something or, or when it's securely protected. Uh, an example of the idea of seal uh, being used in, in a literal sense, it may be you think about someone who, who seals food in a, in a Ziploc bag. And so 
again, you see when something is sealed, it's, it's protected or, or secure. And that's, that's one idea, you know, you think about this, uh, this, this word seal, and that's, that's one, one idea that it actually uh, communicates. But the idea of seal or, or sealed also communicates that whatever is being referred to is certified or, or authentic. It's certified or authentic. In other words, being exactly as claimed. And, and, and for example, you think about uh, an official birth certificate, for, for example. Uh, it, it contains a government seal, and what that seal does is it serves as proof of the citizenship of the person named on the certificate. And so it, it has a seal, and so the seal is to show that the certificate is authentic, it's authentic. Well, in, in John 6, 27, you have Jesus using, using the word seal in describing what the Father did to prove that, that Jesus is who he actually claimed to be. Listen to, uh, to 627. And, and this, is, this is in the, uh, the text where, you remember when Jesus, obviously he fed the 5,000 and, mm -hmm. and, and they tracked him down because they, they wanted some more bread. Yeah. Um, and, and so listen to what he said when they tracked him down, you know, seeking more bread after he had, he had fed the, uh, you know, the, the thousands. It says in, in verse 27 of chapter 6. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give to you, for on him the Father, even God, has set his seal, has set his, his seal. And so Jesus makes it clear that he is who he claims to be. In other words, his, his identity was confirmed by God who set his seal on Christ. God set his seal on Christ. In fact, you remember when in Luke uh, 3, 3.22, when uh, the Spirit descended upon him. And so the Holy Spirit is God's way of, of confirming the genuineness or, or authenticity of those who are his, those who belong to him. He, 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 he marks them by, by the Holy Spirit. And so, so that, that's one idea when you think about this idea of seal. But, but in, in used in that way, seal is also used uh, in reference to believers. Uh, and in fact, we see this in, in 2 Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 2, this is, uh, yeah, 2 Timothy, I'm actually in verse uh, 19, but in, in this section, uh, Paul, he's actually instructed in, in verse, early on in chapter 2, Paul instructed Timothy, Timothy to, there were certain people or certain types of people that he wanted uh, Timothy to avoid. You had people who were spreading false doctrine, and so Paul wanted Timothy to to avoid those people, but he didn't want Timothy to be discouraged by those, by those men. And so in the, in the first half of verse 19, after telling him who to avoid, this is what he said to Timothy in, in beginning in verse 19. He said, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone uh, who names the name of the Lord abstain from wickedness. And so we see, we've seen the, the fact that believers are sealed, and we've seen that, you know, the meaning of this idea of seal, but, but what's the purpose of it, or, or, or the end goal of it? You know, we, we, we've seen it, you know, he, he, we, we, it's clear, believers are sealed, okay? We, we've seen what it means, but, 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 but again, what's, what's the purpose, what's, what's the end goal of it, uh, or goal of it? And so I want to I get that from Ephesians chapter 4, verses, uh, and well, specifically in verse 30. And this is where you're familiar with the passage where Paul is actually uh, telling the Ephesian believers to not grieve the Holy Spirit. But after he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, he goes on to describe what it is that the Holy Spirit had, had done. In, in verse, verse 30 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. For the day of redemption. And so the Holy Spirit seals believers mm -hmm. for the day of redemption. And, and think about the example uh, I mentioned earlier of, of food being sealed in a Ziploc bag. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when you seal it, you might put it away in the freezer uh, until you're ready to pull it out, you know, warm it up, and, and eat it, right? right? But until that time, it remains sealed. It remains sealed, right? And so from the passages that we read in, in Ephesians 1, uh, as well as 2 Corinthians 1 and, and 2 Timothy 2, we've seen that being sealed with the Holy Spirit is a reality that every person who gets saved experiences. That, that's an experience that every saved, person, uh, every saved person has. And therefore, being sealed 
by the Holy Spirit is something that accompanies salvation. It goes along with salvation. So again, if you've been saved, you've also been sealed. You've been securely wrapped up for protection and identified by God as belonging to him. And so being sealed is one reality that comes along with, with being saved. You have been sealed if you've been saved. So, uh, so again, that, that's one reality that comes along or that accompanies uh, being saved. And so uh, are, are there any, any comments or, or thoughts regarding uh, this idea of, of the Holy Spirit sealing those who, who God has, has saved? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> Hopefully we'll, we'll see that tonight. Because I can't tell you where it's found, but I know that the Bible does say that those who are sealed, also their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay. So if your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, mm -hmm. you've been sealed, then your name is going to forever be there. Is that correct? We're going to see tonight, I believe. <laughs> I hope so. But no, that, that's a, you, you, bring up some, uh, you bring up some good points. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Merle, I was just looking at this uh, definition for seal. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was pretty interesting. I think I heard uh, Pastor Kepp mention this in one of his messages, too. But it, it says, as a noun, a device or substance that is used to join two things together so as to prevent them from coming apart or to prevent anything from passing between them. Mm -hmm. So that tight seal that, you know, nothing can get through, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what should separate us from the love of, of Christ. Uh, on the day. That's good hand over. Oh. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But again, we're, I'm just, we're, we're just trying to see what, what it said, what the scripture says about believers, and, and we'll see what conclusion we, we get to. <laughs> good, uh, good stuff. And so, so we've seen that, again, if you've been saved, you've also been, been sealed. You've, you've been sealed. But uh, another reality that, that uh, accompanies salvation is the idea of a pledge, a, a pledge. And, and this idea of a pledge is actually communicated in, in two of the passages that we just looked at when discussing the, uh, the idea of, of being sealed. And so let's look at them again, and I'll, I'll go to, we'll go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse uh, 22. Yeah, 2 Timothy, first, uh, chapter 1, verse 22. And Second Timothy, second I'm, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians, sorry about that. 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 22. Uh, and again, we looked at this when we talked about the uh, believer being sealed. So let's look at it uh, again. So 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 22. Uh, actually, I'll start at 21. Uh, 21, he says, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge, as a, as a pledge. Now, I didn't mention this earlier, but it's clear when he says us uh, that he, he's not just talking about, you know, the apostles. You know, he, this, is, this is clearly all believers because Paul included himself and Timothy as well as the Corinthians. Uh, you know, when he said who establishes us, with you, uh, and so this pledge that Paul is referring to in First Corinthians, uh, yeah, and, I mean in Second Corinthians, was given to all of them. You know, this pledge. But when we looked at Ephesians chapter one, verse thirteen earlier, we didn't read for verse fourteen. And so this time, I actually want to read that because again, it, this is this idea of a pledge is actually there. So I'm, I'm, I'll start again at verse verse thirteen in Ephesians chapter one, verses thirteen and fourteen. In Him, talking about Christ, you also after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. Now, uh, this, this idea of... Uh, this, this idea of, of, well, first of all, as we see the idea of a spirit being, being a pledge is used in both, both of the verses that we just looked at. But, you know, again, what, what does it mean? Well, the word pledge, it, it refers to part of the money that's actually given, um, given up front or, or in advance 
for a transaction to, that's, that's to occur later. And most of us are probably familiar with this, this idea as it's used in the context of a uh, real estate transaction, uh, you know, which often involves an earnest deposit. And so that's when a portion of the purchase price is actually given up front or, or in advance, and it serves as a, as a guarantee that the rest will be given at a later date. You know, so the rest, you know, it, it'll be given later. And so, of course, we know in a real estate transaction, you're dealing with, you're dealing with human beings, though, right? And so, you know, you're dealing with uh, human beings, so it may be a situation where the potential buyer might pay you, you know, whatever, $1,000, $5,000, whatever, uh, as earnest money, and, and, and you might p feel pretty sure that you're gonna receive the rest of the, of the sale price at, at some point, whatever agreed upon date, you know, is on the contract. But uh, the reality is that, you know, things might happen that, that they didn't know about. Uh, you know, things that, that would lead to them not following through with the purchase. You know, and, and, and that doesn't necessarily have to be any, any ill intent on their part, just unforeseen circumstances. I'm not able to go through and obviously get to keep the, keep the, the earnest deposit, but you know, they didn't, they didn't follow through with, with the rest. But the thing is, with God, he's not like us though. Right. And so uh, a lack of knowledge regarding any unforeseen you know, uh, <laughs> future happenings doesn't apply to him because he has all knowledge. You know, so, so any pledge or earnest deposit that he actually gives is a guarantee in the truest sense of the word. And so, um, so whatever the salvation process includes, Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit is actually God's down payment for it. He, he's, he's God's down payment. And so the Holy Spirit comes to reside in the life of the believer to serve as the guarantee of the salvation that was actually given to the believer. You, you could almost say that God gave the pledge knowing all the circumstances that would be against the pledge being uh, the rest of the money coming. The rest of the money coming. That, 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 it, that, that he, he didn't just know it. He <coughs> right. gave in light of all the, in light all of all, the right. issues that could possibly, possibly Right. Come. And that's what it says. It's not any unforeseen circumstances. I mean, he knows all the circumstances and the pledge is given. So, you know, how, how do you, you know, how do we, you know, make sense of that or whatever? And, uh, and again, so you know, the Holy Spirit, as I said, he, when he, he comes to reside in the life of the believer and, and serves as the guarantee of the salvation that was actually given to the believer. And in fact, let's look again at Ephesians 1.14. And, and not only does Paul say that the Holy Spirit is a pledge, which again means, you know, this guarantee of, of our inheritance, he also tells us, well, what's the duration of this pledge, though? You know, what, 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 is, what is the duration of it? Notice, notice what he says in, in, uh, again in verse, uh, what is it, in, in verse 14, when he says, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. And this is similar to when we discussed how long believers would be sealed. Remember we talked about, you know, well, the seal, is, is, it remains until. Well, this idea of, of a pledge the, uh, well, the seal remains until the seal was no longer needed. But so Paul is looking, looking to the end when he says, with a view to the redemption of God's possession. So he's actually looking to the end and saying, until you acquire what God has in store for you at the end, he has given you a guarantee that you're actually going to possess what he has actually purchased for you. Mm -hmm. So again, uh, he says, he, the pledge has been given with a view to the redemption of God's own possession with, with the view to that he says and so uh, receiving a pledge again and that, that's another spiritual reality that actually accompanies salvation so again if you have been saved you've also received a pledge a, a down payment and so when we think about you know obviously we've been sealed we've, we've, we've received a pledge and uh, you know we, we, we know for example think about the Holy Spirit and, and, and the different ministries and uh, that he does in, in, in the lives of the believers. Obviously, he teaches us, he intercedes for us, he, he, he guides us, I mean, he, he does all these things, but, but do you think people often look at him as being the earnest deposit for salvation? Because I mean, if you just ask me, like, what, you know, what, what does the Holy Spirit do? I, I remember having a conversation with, with someone who, you know, they believe in, you know, all the different you know, the, the different sign gifts or whatever. And when, when I was saying from scripture why I didn't believe the things that they were saying, it was, well, I, I don't even believe the Holy Spirit. You know, I, basically, I don't believe the Holy Spirit is, is, 
you know, I don't believe that he's acting. What? It's, like, it's like, what do you, you don't believe the Holy Spirit? No, that I do believe the Holy Spirit. And, but I don't believe that, you know, what, what you're saying, but I say that to say, if somebody asks us or asks you, what does the Holy Spirit do? You know, if you, you're accused of that, is this something that you would have you listed? I don't think I would have listed it when I, when I say all the things that he does, I wouldn't say, would, probably wouldn't have thought or, or written, wouldn't have brought up the most fact people, that he's actually our earnest divine. Most people go to the gifts. Go to the gifts, right. I mean, they, they go to the gifts. Yeah. They, don't, they don't go to the gifts. Go to the, yeah. Yeah. And, and again, like I said, that's, that's most of us, even, even people who believe properly about the Holy Spirit, we probably wouldn't, this probably wouldn't be one of the first things that we, that we actually go to. And yet we see that this is something that accompanies salvation. Uh, any, any, uh, anybody else, any, any thoughts regarding the, the fact that you have actually received a down payment or, or earnest money from God, an earnest payment from God? Like, that's, that's a, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's company, especially in light of, like you said earlier, this is not, I mean, he knows all of the circumstances that could potentially happen or, or all of the things that not potential, all of the things that, that are going to happen in life. Right. And he gave you earnest deposit. Interesting. Any, any thoughts on that? You know, one of the things that I've, I've got that's kind of my mind as I think about this is that, um, you know, most of us think about a house, but, you know, we, this, is almost, this is almost like something in layaway. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm old enough where I know that <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't know if yeah. know that when younger. And so, uh, so you know, you would, you would anticipate yeah. when you could redeem it out of it. And so just thinking about, you know, God is anticipating bringing us to himself is a comforting idea. Absolutely. You know, because, you know, we, we, just, we just enjoyed the idea of this coming a day when I'm going to get that thing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when you're there, when they, when your parents put it in there, yeah. you. <laughs> like I saw it. <laughs> mm. You received the down payment already. Huh? <laughs> Amen. Good, good, good. All right. Uh, another uh, effect. I, I don't know. If, uh, well, let's say I don't know if we tend to think of this, but uh, I've heard people mention this, but. But another effect that I want us to look at is, is the, uh, the location to which believers have actually been taken. I'm going to say that again. Hmm. The location to which believers have been taken. Now, I, I do want to point this out. When I, when I sent in the, uh, the slides to the media team, I, I actually didn't include the ones that uh, accompany this. So, so uh, you just got to listen good. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, First of all, actually, I want to look at a passage in, in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 6. First of all, to, to see the reality regarding where believers have actually, uh, have actually been taken. And in the, in the first three verses of this, of this uh, chapter, in chapter 2, uh, Paul, he actually reminds the Ephesians of the condition and really the pattern of life that, that describes how they were before God saved them. And so, you know, he paints this, this dark picture uh, as a reminder of, for them to see, like, this was you. You know, you, you, can't, you can't look down on somebody like this. This was really you. But after that, in, in verse 4, he says, uh, okay, yeah, in, yeah, in verse 4, now I'll read, uh, I'll read 4 through 6. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in our transgressions made us alive together with christ by grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in christ jesus now what's striking to me about what paul said regarding believers being seated with christ is that paul doesn't speak about it merely in relation to what awaits believers when they die. I don't know if you, you, you caught that, but he's speaking in terms of right now. And we know that's the case because he includes himself and the Ephesians 
as having already been seated. That's past tense. Mm -hmm. Even though at the time of the writing, Paul and the Ephesians were still around. They hadn't died yet. Mm -hmm. So Paul was saying that right now, although we're alive and well, we're also seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And, and I, I mentioned this even, even last week, but here we have another example of what some refer to as already not yet. In, in other words, something that is true now, but that will be fully experienced in the future. And now I, I do know now some people might, might see, you know, might say, well, Paul doesn't really mean that, that those who have been saved are actually seated uh, with Christ right now. And so what those people believe is that it's so sure to happen that Paul is speaking as though it had already happened. Yeah. However, what that does is, is totally dismisses the clear biblical teaching that spiritually speaking, believers have actually been placed in Christ. In fact, mm -hmm. listen to what Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verse 17. You're, you're familiar with this, with this passage, but after Paul makes it clear in verse 16 that he doesn't recognize people based on any earthly labels that, they, that they've adopted for themselves or that other people have given them, he turned around and said this in verse, verse 17. Therefore, if any man, listen to this, is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So what he says about being a new creature is true only of those who are what? In Christ. In Christ. Only those who are in Christ. So our being placed in Christ is not something that's spoken of as being, as being future. So with that being the case, let me ask you a question. Where is Christ right now? I heard in heaven, I heard seated at the right hand of the Father. And, and so we just saw that, 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 uh, that, that we're in Christ. He talks about believers, believers being, being uh, in Christ. And so those who have been saved are actually seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And, and, and this, is, this is important. Remember, and we, we looked at it last week about, uh, well, we, we introduced it last week about this idea of us being spirit. But remember, what you see with the physical eye is not the only reality. Correct. You know, t take for example the words of, uh, let's look, look at Romans, Romans, I'll read Romans chapter 6, mm -hmm. verses 3 through 5. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this is uh, Paul asking them, he says, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, that our body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slave, uh, slaves to sin. Now, do you think that, that, that uh, being baptized into Christ's death or, or being buried with him and being raised from the dead are actual spiritual truths that have happened to the believer? Yes. And, and again, remember last week we saw believers are spirit as a result of being born again by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So what, what I want you to see is again that these, these are spiritual realities that the eye cannot see. And that the believer, uh, you know, the idea that believers are seated in heaven is one of those realities. Mm -hmm. you, you, the, I can't see that. Mm -hmm. And so, again, if you've been saved, you are seated in heaven right now. You're, you're seated in heaven right now. Mm. And, and so when, when I say, the, you know, the, the, there, are, there are realities that, that the I can't see, do you, do you, in other words, let me ask you this, do you have to feel like you're seated in heaven in order for you to believe that that's the case. No, 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 no. no. And, and that, and you really think about it, that's really the essence of faith. Yeah. In other words, once I see something in the Bible, oh man, I would have never thought that, but oh, he said it, okay. Yeah. So I, I believe it and live in light of that. Yeah. Right. Act based on what he's actually said, even though I, I don't see how, because if you, you ask me how the passage I read from Romans 6, there's, I, cannot un, I cannot explain to you how that, how that happened. We, we, were, we were born thousands of years after Christ, but he's saying somehow mm -hmm. you trusted in Christ, you actually died with him. Mm -hmm. 
Like, I, I can't make sense of that. <coughs> but I believe it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because because that's, that's what, the, what the scripture actually says. And so we, we, we live in light of what he says, you know, what, what the scripture actually says. So I don't have to have, be able to fully explain. I don't have to feel like it. You know, there's sometimes, and we, we talked about this even earlier in Sunday school, I'm sure sometimes you don't feel forgiven. Yeah. But if I read the scripture, you know, as a believer, he says, you know, confess your sins and he, he's, uh, you know, he, he's faithful to, uh, you know, he, he's uh, uh, to, and just to forgive you all your sins and cleanse you all in righteousness. But isn't a water you might not feel it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. Go ahead. Isn't a water baptism a picture of what you're uh, explaining here? Yeah. Does that be a picture of it? Yeah. You know, when you go down and you come up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so, again, you know, us, us not being able to see something doesn't make it any less, any less real. Correct. Uh, in fact, I would argue, you know, some things we see are not <laughs> what, what they appear to be. Yeah. And so, you know, the, uh, you know, and even, even what we see, you know, what we see is, is, is we're looking through eyes that have been impacted by seeing. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. And so, you know, in some, some ways we can say this, this stuff, some of the stuff we see is even less real than you know, these, these spiritual realities that, that, uh, that we're actually talking about. And so again, you know, I, I mentioned it last week, I think sometimes when we read, read these passages, certain passages when it talks about, you know, for example, people being dead, or we, even when, when, when we read in Ephesians earlier, when Paul reminded them that they were dead, some people may read over that and think that it's, it's almost like they were dead. No, 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 you were dead. Actually dead. <laughs> right, you, 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 he doesn't mean you were kind of like, you know, it, it was something similar to being dead, no, you actually really were dead. And so I, I think, you know, again, when we, when we realize that, uh, you know, that, that as a result of the new birth, we are spirit. And so now we, we can understand these, these, these spiritual realities that we had no way of, of understanding before. And so this idea of us being seated in heavenly places right now, you know, in Christ Jesus right now is, uh, is, is a wonderful reality uh, that, that believers have actually, uh, have actually experienced. Uh, and so an, another reality that accompanies salvation uh, is the giving of eternal life, the giving of eternal life. Uh, and so actually I want to read a, pa a couple of passages to, one, to establish, I mean obviously we're familiar with it, but to establish this idea that believers have, uh, have eternal life. I'm going to read John chapter 3 verses 35 through 36. This is, uh, this is Jesus talking, he said, Uh, do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already uh, he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal that he who... Was, no, actually, that's, did I read the right... Which one did I, no, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 4, uh, uh, chapter 3, 35 to 36. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, this, uh, John 4. Which one is? Did I write the wrong one down? Uh, chapter, I think it's three. Yeah, chapter 34 and five. Okay, 30, yeah, I, I'm, I'm actually going to read chapter 3, 35 and 36. It says, the father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God actually abides on him. And what I want you to see from that particular passage is that Believers actually have eternal life, actually have eternal life. In other words, it's not just that they will receive it later, but they actually have it right now. They have it. And, and also we see this same idea in John chapter 5, uh, verse 24. Again, Jesus is talking. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. And so once again, it's clear that believers have eternal life right now. And so that's been established, but, but like we did with the ones earlier, what does it mean though? You know, we, we hear eternal life, you know, the, the eternal life that God promises for those who come to Christ. Uh, so we've established that, uh, well, we've, we've seen it, that it's established that we have eternal life. But again, what does it actually mean? Well, first of all, the, the word eternal is usually used as an, as an adjective. And this, in, in scripture, some of the words that is used to describe are, for example, fire, we see that in, in Matthew 18, 8. 
uh, punishment, Matthew 25, 46, destruction, uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 9, inheritance, Hebrews 9, 15, and when the word is used to describe, uh, to describe those things, it usually communicates the idea of perpetual or, or never ending. Basically, something being forever. And so, so that, that's the idea behind it. But when it's used to describe life, the idea is more than just being forever. It's not, not just being ever, uh, being forever. What makes it significant is that it, it's, it's, uh, it's life with God forever. Uh, you know, being with him and, and where everything is as it should be for his glory. And so again, it's, it's not just the idea of, of uh, you know, of, of forever. And from the passages that we read in, in, in John, when Jesus talked about eternal life, we saw that eternal life, again, is something that believers have, have right now. And even though we, we, we saw that we have it right now, you may be thinking, well, how is that possible though? Uh, well, one aspect of, of eternal life involves experiencing God uh, it really in, 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 in such a way that, that we know him and know his son, Jesus Christ. We, we, we know him, in other words, knowing the one who you will be with forever. And, and we see this in, in John chapter 17, verses, uh, verses one, one through three. And this is, uh, this is when Jesus, uh, in, in the section where, it, in, in your Bibles, maybe maybe type the high priestly prayer. But listen to, listen to what uh, Jesus spoke in, in the very first three verses of this chapter. It says, these things Jesus spoke and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come Glorify thy son, that the son may glorify thee, even as thou gavest him authority over all mankind, that to all whom thou hast given him, he may give eternal life. And this is eternal life, mm -hmm. that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And so when, he, when he's talking about this, this, this knowledge, though, this, this knowing God and, and knowing Christ, he's, he's talking about an experiential knowledge. Uh, you know, and this, this experiential knowledge that Jesus is talking about is unique to believers. And so only a, only a believer can, can truly say they know God in the way that Jesus is describing here. And, and not only that, it's true of every believer. And so there's, there's, there's no special class of, of believers who, who this applies to. And in fact, listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, is it four uh, actually I'll, I'll read, uh, I'll read 20, uh, where is it at? Okay, yeah, and so yeah, Ephesians, so, so, so out, now he, he's painting this picture of, of, of how really unbelievers just walk around in a life of, of darkness, basically, you know, that's, that's the, in, in Ephesians 4, but after he paints this picture, listen to what he said regarding the Ephesian believers beginning in, in verse 20. He says, you know, after he paints this very dark picture. Then he says, but you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. And so what Paul is, is talking about is, is this, this knowledge that, that God used in conjunction with with with, with uh, that, that basically he used in conjunction with giving them the new life that changed them from what they used to be. And so they are changed people because they have experienced Christ. They, they have a saving knowledge of Christ. And so Paul could confidently say to them, look, if you're a Christian, I know you didn't learn Christ in a way that would lead to what, what he described in the previous verses. You know, because he's painting this dark, this dark picture, but those who've experienced Christ, those who have a, a saving knowledge of Christ, he, he knows that if you're a Christian, he says, you did not learn Christ in this way. He's confident. I know for a fact that that's true, if indeed you have heard him. In other words, if you're a true believer, I know you didn't learn Christ in that way. And so, so again, uh, eternal life includes having a knowledge of God that goes beyond just knowing information about God. You know, see, a person can, can know information about God and not know God. And, and, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of that, uh, you know, that, that goes around uh, today. But the passage that we read in, in John focused on the experiential knowledge that I've been talking about. But as I said, there's also an aspect that includes believers 
not just experiencing God, but being with him forever, being with him forever. Now, typically, when we think of, of being with God, we might think of going to be with him. And, and obviously, that's something that's going to happen, and that, that's going to be when we'll get the full experience of the salvation that we've actually been granted. However, when God actually saves a person, though, he sends the Holy Spirit to live within them. Mm -hmm. And so he's with us right now. We, we've already gotten a taste of our salvation. You know, in other words, he's helping us to grow in our understanding of him and our knowledge of him. And, and that's going to continue until we indeed go and be with him. In, in fact, Peter makes reference to this, this future sphere of existence in 2 Peter uh, 3.18 when he says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And so, so he's speaking of that, 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 that future uh, sphere of existence where, where we're going to fully experience uh, uh, God. And so if you've been saved, you have eternal life right now. Right now. You know, this is not just something that he's talking about uh, that's, that's actually going to be something experienced in the future. And so, you know, we've looked at, you know, the, these things, or at least just a few of the things that, that, that come along with being saved, but I, I think by, by understanding what comes along with being saved, it, it really helps us to know what losing salvation would have to entail, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think oftentimes when people think about, you know, for example, they say a person has lost their salvation, they simply mean, they, they may say, okay, that person, yeah, that person is no longer following Christ, and because of that, the person is no longer going to heaven when he or she dies. And so basically you have a situation where the person was going to heaven and now that's not the case. So, so that, that's what it means to lose salvation in that person's mind. But, but after having the discussion that we've looked at tonight, I, I hope you see that for a person to lose his or her salvation wow. would also mean the undoing of some things that some people might not have actually taken into consideration. Yep. And yep. so yep. if salvation can be lost, Here's a recap of what that would actually require. Well, first of all, it would require the undoing of the seal that the believer received from God. Now, you may say, well, what, what's the big deal about that? But remember, the seal was supposed to be an indication that those who received it were secure and genuine. Those were the two things we looked at, this idea of seal being, being wrapped up uh, in, in a secure manner and actually, and, and actually being, uh, having, having a, a seal that, that, uh, or a mark that identifies you as being authentic or genuine. And so the fact that the Holy Spirit is said to be that seal, so basically the seal would not have served the purpose that it was actually supposed to serve. It's a bad seal. <laughs> and what does that imply about the Holy Spirit? Because yeah. he was given for that purpose. Right. He was given as the seal. And so to lose your salvation would require would require the undoing of that seal. But it would also require, uh, it, well, not only would it require, but, but the down payment would have proven to not be the security that it was said to be. Mm. Now, when we, when we looked at down payment, we looked at you know, it being an earnest, earnest deposit. And supposedly, you know, when we looked at the text, supposedly the down payment was a guarantee that the person who received it will receive the rest of all that remains. In other words, there was a balance remaining that the one who gave the deposit promised to pay later. And so losing salvation would mean that the down payment was actually worthless mm. because it was given to be a guarantee, but then I didn't actually get what was promised. Well, what's the purpose of the, the down payment? Exactly. It, it, it proved to be worthless. Mm. And, and also we would see that losing salvation would require uh, really the believer to be removed from heavenly places where he's actually been seated by God. You know, in other words, he's in heaven right now waiting to be united with his resurrected body. That's not going to happen. And, and also, the eternal life that the person once had would have proven to be temporary rather than eternal. And so, hope you can wrap your head around this, but that would mean that it's possible to temporarily have something forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't yeah. make sense. 
or maybe I don't know if you temporarily have it, have it forever, or if you forever have something temporarily, I'm not sure which one. But again, you, 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 you have to temporarily have something forever because we've already seen, he said, you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. No, it, it would be different if he said, look, I'm gonna give you eternal life. Okay, you lost, so now you're not going to get it. That's one thing, but the passages that we looked at, we've seen that you already have eternal life. Mm -hmm. And so again, for you to lose salvation would mean that you temporarily had something forever. You have something that's forever, but not forever. <laughs> and I, I, I didn't include this one, but I, you know, another thing I was thinking about is, is you know, the, the it, it would really require, I don't even know how this would happen, but it would require, you would have to somehow unknow Christ. You have, you have to unknow him. And remember we, what we saw earlier, only believers know Christ in the way that he described in John 17 too, right? So we talked about this experiential knowledge. In other words, you have nobody who's, who's, who's an unbeliever who knows Christ and knows God in the way that he described in 17 too. But you know, you remember in Matthew 7, 23, when Jesus talked about how, well, we, we learned that he was gonna tell those false prophets that he never knew them. Mm. Mm. He, 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 he never knew them. He doesn't say he doesn't know them anymore. Yeah. I, I never knew you. I, I never knew you, and so if a person somehow loses his or her salvation, that person would have to somehow un, unknow God. I, I don't know. If, I, don't, I don't even know. <laughs> it, it hurts your head trying to think about it. But but again, these, these are just some things that that would have to have to be undone for a person to lose their salvation. Because we've already seen the Scripture establishes that these things have already happened. Yes. And so to lose your salvation is not just a matter of okay, you're not going to heaven anymore. There's some other things that that again have to be undone mm -hmm. and and so i think a lot of times when this when this topic is discussed these are not the things that that people talk about it's just a matter of okay you sinned and you know this passage right here shows that you can lose your salvation well this passage right here says you you can't and so it's a back and forth but what are the things that accompany salvation that have to be undone for you to lose it? any uh any any thoughts and so you're really left with either either God has taken them away, which the only, that's the only thing that could happen, or you're more powerful than God is. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Make yeah, any and sense. One, one of the things I, I was going to look at that, even, even uh, you think about where everybody coming into the world, you're, you're described as being in the, in the uh, you're, you're, in a, you're in a kingdom. But what happens is God delivers you from that kingdom, right? Right. And so you've been transferred from one kingdom to another. So to lose it, I mean, I, I guess maybe a more, did a more power, because Satan obviously wants you. So was a more powerful king, you know, able to come and pull, pull you out of, I mean, because, you know, even when we went to the book of Mark, one of the things we saw is Jesus proved that he's more powerful. You know, he, he went in and, 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 and took, you know, from, 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 from uh, Satan's kingdom. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and the scripture says the only way that, that can happen is, is a, a powerful, a more powerful king has to be, you know, and so maybe is it you know I, I don't you know again I don't know and that, that was one of the ones we're going to look at uh, to a question hand back there. Ron, I just think of um, John ten twenty eight, where the Lord said he just made a simple statement that I give them eternal life; they'll never perish, and no one can snatch them out of my hand. Can't happen. Absolutely can't happen. Amen. struggle with it now, mm -hmm. but when I first, uh, you know, heard of this, uh, this, this yeah. document and teaching, I did, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because of, growing, you know, being saved in the holiness church, right. you're going to hear all of the, gotcha. the you know, don't Absolutely. do this and this right. and that. It's, it's a work-based salvation. Work -based. Right. And I think, and that's why, you know, even, even last week, one of the things I wanted to do is kind of look at, you know, an overview of salvation, because that's something you said, it, it made sense that, that you actually, that, that you actually believe that you can lose it. It was actually consistent with how you got in in the first place. 
So, you know, when you talk about uh, if, if, it was a, if it was based on your work, I would say I would have a, I would I would be more confused if you didn't think you can lose your salvation. You know what I mean? And so the issue wasn't like you said, not to say, okay, get your thoughts to change on this. Well, it's on the front end. Well, how did you get in? And that's one of the things we saw last week. The prerequisite was satisfied by by God Himself. Mm -hmm. He initiated by giving you the new birth. Mm -hmm. And so again, it wasn't based on 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 man's will. But I, I would I would definitely say if someone believes it's based on their will to be consistent, they definitely need to think that they can lose it because it was up to you that you got it, you know, you know <laughs> to be consistent. But yeah, that's a, uh, you know, praise God for that though. Counseling with a friend of mine who I used to work with that struggled with uh, John, and we mentioned it tonight, John chapter three, verse 36. She re reads that verse in, you know, she, she, does, she believes that you can lose your salvation. Mm -hmm. And that verse says that he who believes and the son has eternal life. Mm -hmm. But he who does not obey the son mm -hmm. shall not see life, mm -hmm. but the wrath of God abides. Right. Right. Yeah. So how can I, so, so, so how do you explain that? You know, well, I, well, first, I, I would start, you know, if you get a chance, maybe even talking about the things that we, the, the things that accompany salvation that we talked about tonight. But as it specifically relates to this verse, in this verse, in order to believe what she would believe, the first part when it says, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, she would have to carry that over to the last part of the verse and say, it's those same people who don't believe and now they lost it. But he's contrasting two different, you know, two different, you know, people. The one who believes in the Son has eternal life. The one who, who does not obey, that's not describing somebody who believes in the Son. And so, but, but she would have to say, this is describing the same person. The person believes in the Son, has eternal life, but at some point, that person started disobeying, and now they no longer have it. And so that's, yeah, that, that's how that's how she would uh, probably understand that passage. But obviously, that's, it's not it's not saying that. And that's why I say, you know, rather than maybe focusing on, uh, and again, you probably have to to get to it. But I would I would maybe start with, uh, you know, some of the things that we talked about tonight, or or things like those that actually comes along with with being saved. You know, what what does it mean to be saved? Because again, I think sometimes it's more so focused on on a location that you're going. In other words, when you die, you're going to heaven. That's what it means to be saved. And so you sin or you did whatever, okay, now you're not going. So the only thing that's changed is, the, is your, your destination and it totally ignores all of the spiritual realities that have actually occurred as a result of, of you being saved right now. Do you think some of what people struggle with, this is based on Gene's question, do you think some of what people struggle with is, is the idea of struggle? Like some people think, if I'm saved, I'm not going to have any struggle. I'm not going to struggle with sin. I'm not going right. to struggle with unbelief. Yeah. Yeah. And real Christians struggle with unbelief. Right. They struggle with sin. I mean, uh, I think that's part of it, too, is that, that they just don't, they don't understand the Christian life. Right. And so when, when they start to live the Christian life and experience what we naturally experience, right. well, people like us, we just keep rolling. I mean, right. we, because we, we trust the Bible right. and, and, we, and we know that struggle, we, yeah. that we're going to struggle. It's almost like they're so sensitive that if they have one conniption, right. I mustn't be saved. Right. Yes, yes, thank you. That's good. And I, I can't rationalize how would I do X, Y, and Z if I was saved. How could I say, you know, say or do or whatever the case may be. And then so now, you know, my own conscience is condemning me as opposed to saying, you know what, I did do X, Y, and Z, but the scripture actually gives the prescription on what to do when you do X, Y, and Z. And so, but yeah, I, I do, to answer that question, I do think that that is the, uh, I think that's a huge huge thing that, uh, that, that leads to, to that because again, and, and some of that, I, I wouldn't put it on one thing as far as why that's the case, but I think some of that is, you know, there's enough bad teaching out there where mm. you're telling people if you get saved, everything is gonna be fine. Right. Mm. So you can imagine how that individual yeah, yeah. came thinking that it's gonna be one way, and then when it's not that, I can definitely see how that person, you know, would, would struggle, but not to say that's the only type of person. That's, I mean, in other words, that's not the only way that somebody can, can struggle with that, but I do think that is a part of it when you, you, you have a, uh, uh, a false understanding of what the Christian life actually is, like, like Pastor said. And so when, that, when that's the case and you live in, con or something happens contrary to that, then I, I, I must have lost my salvation. Anything. 
about Christ being our intercessor. Oh, well, yeah. Who needs an intercessor? Right. Exactly. <laughs> Except people who sin. <laughs> you know, and so that, that, that obviously implies something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're going to need the work of that intercessor Absolutely. even as a Christian. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, he's interceding on behalf of believers. Uh, and so, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, it, it's, 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 you know, I, I would say, you know, again, with the friend, I would maybe, uh, you know, maybe discuss some of the some of the uh, things we talked about here tonight, and I, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully, uh, Lord uses that to, to at least get his attention. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. No, that, that cannot affect. In fact, I, I was one of the things I was gonna, I was gonna, uh, and I, we didn't do it, but I was gonna distinguish between the security that we talked about earlier versus assurance. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. you can, you can, like in other words, the security that's that's set, that's that's by God. The assurance is you. I may not, man, I don't feel like I'm saved right now. Now, if you truly are saved, that doesn't change the fact you feeling like you're unsaved. If you if you tr you know truly repent and place your faith in Christ. You being saved is not based on how, how, how you actually, uh, how you actually, you know, what you feel. And I, one of the examples I was going to use, you think about when, when God wiped out, you know, the, the, the earth before and he saved Noah and his family. Well, I can imagine every time it rained, well, well let me back up. When he, when he saved them, he told them, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a sign, right? The sign was going to be the rainbow. And I, I would imagine... As their family started to grow, they probably passed the story down about, you know, just, just, I'm, I mean, just amazement that, that they saw that they actually experienced. And then I would imagine that the, their families, probably every time it rained, they probably thought, like, is he about to do it again? <laughs> is he about to do it again? And so I'm sure they, you know, they passed it on down and, and told whatever. But what happens if someone doesn't know? When they, when they see that, oh, man, they're convinced that God is about to wipe out the world by, by, by water again. Well, their ignorance of, of what the rainbow is for, or even their ignorance of knowing it's even there, doesn't change the covenant God has already made. He said he's not going to do it. I'm giving this sign. You not knowing anything about the sign doesn't change the fact of it. So, so if a person truly is saved, they can believe that they can lose their salvation and, and their, their, uh, you know, their eternal destiny is not based on it because you didn't get saved based on believing right about you know, uh, eternal destiny. Eternal destiny. <laughs> you got saved based on you know, relying upon Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I appreciate everything you just said. I think, um, obviously, so in the church today, we tend to focus on evangelism, as we should, when wanting people to come and know the Lord. I would say, though, even after that, when they come to know the Lord, they're going to need somebody in their life to help them Amen. experience some of this stuff. Because um, I do think sometimes we tend to, okay, well, they're safe, they're good, and pull back a little bit. But you, you need to be able to walk through these things with them because this is, it is crucial. Right. And um, exactly, that's exactly right. right. So and, and I, it, it, this is really practical ways to, you know, even to, to walk through uh, that with someone who is, who is a new believer. Yeah, and, and the thing is, one of the things I was trying to stress, uh, I don't know if I did a good job last week about, you know, just spiritual realities versus, versus you know, physical realities. Like, the physical reality should help us to understand, like, how to go about, you know, some of the things in the spiritual realm. So, like, like you just talked about, no one would have a, a baby, okay, now this baby's uh, into the world, and leave that baby off to themselves. Okay, right. now the baby's fine. Right. Like, the baby needs you. More than ever. You know, more, more than ever. And so I, I would argue that the, the, what you actually talked about, that, that's about, that's discipleship. You know, yeah. discipleship, if, you know, is about teaching and, 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 and helping that person to learn more about Christ, obey Christ. And so, you know, it definitely doesn't stop at, at, the, uh, at the point of, okay, this person comes to a saving knowledge of Christ. No, you, you're absolutely right about that.
problem that people receive Christ and left alone. And no amount of discipleship, teaching, guidance to make sure, to make sure that pastor, you stay with them. Yeah. You know, until they're able to walk on their own and you you, you become a testament to that yeah. and you see it. Yeah. Then you know. Yeah. Then you go, uh, move on from that person. You know, until they are, and then uh, you know, people you left the number with them, you left if you, if you have problems, you can right. talk. We can talk. Right. But if, if you ever lead that person on like you do, like you're like the baby, yeah. they go <laughs> just just there and then everything comes in and they go, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. You're right. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh and, and I'll leave this is the last but but even even uh, what you just said, it, it really it really should cause us to not be so quick as to, you know, just shut somebody out like yeah. why that person leave XYZ? If that, in other words, if we knew their background, we knew no one ever taught them, like, oh. it shouldn't be a surprise. Like, you know, and instead of writing them off, right. you know, maybe, maybe you can be that person who, yeah. you know, if, if they're open to it or whatever. But, uh, but no, these, these guys brought up some uh, very, very good, uh, good, good points. But yeah, we'll go ahead and end in a, uh, in a word of prayer. I definitely appreciate the comments and questions you guys uh, made and raised tonight. So let's go ahead and bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, for your word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, for what we've learned regarding uh, what you've done for us, Heavenly Father. We just thank you so much for, for the security that we have, Heavenly Father. And I pray that, that we would live in light of, of, of what you have done, Heavenly Father, that we would, we would live lives that, that show how appreciative we, uh, we are of, of uh, just for you saving us, Heavenly Father, not leaving us to ourselves. Thank you so much for Christ, for him giving his life for us, Heavenly Father. And I just pray that you would help us to uh, continue to grow and mature in your word and uh, just help us to seek to uh, impact others with the gospel of Christ, Heavenly Father. And I just uh, ask these things in your son, Jesus' name. Amen.